if I open the hearing by the Principal Conservation Commission, I would like to ask George to do a roll call for the call on purpose. Abadili? Present. Foster? Present. Gilmore present. Hearn? Present. Lee? Present. Morin? Not here. He's, He's there. Do again, just a minute, George. Oh, oh. Busy. Now can you hear? Yeah, I can hear you. Just say present, Larry. Present. Okay, thank you. Sam Poo is not here. Uh, Administrator Darcy Carley. She stepped away, George, I believe. Okay. Staff, staff, member. staff member Kim Cavanaugh. Present. Agent Ed Hoops. Uh, present. And I know Darcy Carley is present. Tom, will you want to answer for her? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, floor is yours, Mr. Chairman. Okay. I'll get Dorothy when she comes back in. Yeah. This, meet of, this meeting is being recorded and transmitted by the Information Technology Department of the Town of Barnstable on Channel 18. Under Mass General Law, Chapter 38, Section 20, anyone else desiring to make such a recording or transmission, please let Channel 18 and I know. Hearing none... This afternoon, the first item on the agenda is the old and new business. This is the annual report uh, for the Sandy Neck. Uh, Nina, welcome. Hi, good afternoon, commissioners. Nina Coleman, <clears throat> Sandy Neck Park Manager and also the Director of Natural Resources. I am gonna attempt to share my screen. Everybody have that? Got it. Okay. Got it. Excellent. Um, so under the two orders of conditions that um, we're able to manage the beach, uh, I am required to come before the Conservation Com Commission annually uh, to provide a report. Um, and I am doing so in December this year. So I did provide everybody the report um, and I just wanna go through it and then I certainly take any questions you might have. Um, just as an overview, 2022 uh, was one of those record-breaking years in so many aspects. Um, I'd like to say that I probably should just do a mic drop and leave at this point because it was one of those years where um, people were happy. We had a lot of opportunity for off-road vehicle access. In fact, we never turned anybody away except for tides. Uh, we had a nice section of beach thanks to our habitat conservation permit. Um, so we had a big section of beach always available. Um, we had a record-breaking year for a number of clovers uh, and also for um, productivity rates. And we had a really great year for Diamondback Terrapins as well. So it was one of those years where everything kind of came together. And as I like to say, don't expect it <laughs> every year. It's one of those, those rare happenings. So we can just go through the data, um, starting at the top with our, with our piping clover numbers. As I mentioned, uh, it was a record-breaking year. Uh, we had 50 clover pairs. Um, this is a trend that the Cape and Massachusetts is seeing, where clover uh, pair numbers are going up, uh, which is great, but it also means that they're encroaching on recreational activities. Um, so the 50 pairs is something we definitely wanna um, address uh, as moving forward we are renewing our habitat conservation plan and we are going to ask for an additional take uh sort of as insurance as those numbers go up we want to be able to uh manage our beach and still provide recreational opportunities so 50 pairs um and of those uh 50 pairs we we're able to fledge 97 chicks which is a 1.98 productivity rate um, so that's well above, um, you know, what you what we're always kind of going for, which is 1.25. So we did quite well in the plovers this year. Um, with our habitat conservation permit, we deterred two pairs in the first 0.5 miles of beach, um, and those pairs did fine after our deterrent activities. Dimebag terrapins also did extremely well. Um, we had. 389 females come up into our dunes and nest. Um, the record was 406, which was uh, 2021. And I know everybody wanted to break the record, but I think we came close enough. Um, but what is notable is not only did we have a lot of uh, terrapins nest, 
um, we had low uh, pre predation rates. Um, so in past years, we've had many of our nests predated mostly by uh, fox, weasel, um, skunk, raccoon. Um, but for this year, those rates were down. And so we were able to, or we, we uh, estimate that about 320 diamondback terrapin nests hatched this year in the fall. As we do every year, we collect a number of those hatchlings um, and we head start them through a number of organizations, mostly here in the town of Barnstable, but also in other towns as well, mostly schools, but they're at the senior center, they're at the town manager's office. Um, we have turtles kind of being head started everywhere. Uh, so 27 organizations had started 62 turtles um, and that, that date, that is for last year. Um, this year we have started already our, our 2023 animals. Turns can continue to do bad statewide. Uh, turns back in the day, there were three to 400 pairs of turns on Sandy Neck and now in uh, this year we only had 88. Um, that's like I said, a, a state trend. Um, turns are heavily affected by washover and predation and development. In the fall of 2021, we only had uh, three loggerheads rescued at Sandy Neck. That doesn't mean that there weren't a lot of tur uh, turtle rescues on the Cape, but um, the winds weren't favorable for Sandy Neck. Um, I will say as a little highlight, we spent the last five days, um, pretty much haven't slept in five days. We've been pulling turtles off our beach for the last five days with these strong north winds. And uh, we just rescued 105 animals off of Sandy Neck. Um, and and counting. So it's been quite an exciting few days and you will see that all over Facebook if you if you look at the town site. Um, it's really excellent to, to do these turtle rescues. These are extremely rare animals. Um, I'll continue with my re wetland restoration project. It's 20 plus years now on this project. Um, we removed Phragmites and a number of other uh, invasive species from wetlands, but also from uh, from our primary dune. Um, there's an invasive plant um, called uh, spotted knapweed that we've been uh, pulling out of our primary dune um, for years. Um, and so we continue on with that project. Uh, we do use herbicide for a few of these species, but many of them are just pulled out just like you would a weed. Moving on to page two. Um, enforcement was about average this year, um, but I want to note that we had such a huge year with so many folks enjoying the beach. I think it's really great to see that enforcement at state level while usership went up. Um, I want to note also that uh, the enforcement efforts that we did, which we track, we track all of it uh, digitally on each patron's, under each patron's name. So if a patron has been talked to about something like dog off leash, that is noted on their permit so that the next time that we interface with that patron, we can look that up and, real, and decide if we need to increase our efforts or our, our feedback, if you will. Um, and perhaps now it's time for a citation. So all of this is digitally tracked, um, but uh, looking at that data at the end of this year, we're noting that there's uh, less alcohol issues, which is also a very good trend. Uh, COVID kind of did a hard stop with a lot of that. Um, and when we started revving back up, we really set the tone that we want our beach to be family friendly um, and, and keep that at a, a simmer rather than a boil. So of course we had a record breaking year for people on the beach, so we had quite a, a good year for revenue, um, 1,273,696 dollars. So very well uh, with the revenue. Um, I want to remind the commission that it's not just about the revenue, it's about using these funds to put back into our programs, not just our infrastructure, but all of these outreach programs that we do education, terrapin programs, the invasive species removal, all of it is funded by our users through the um, the enterprise account. So um, I always want to point that out. I mean, that as a park manager, that's really my my 
you know, my priority when I look at revenues, how can we give back to Sandy Neck, to the, to the, to the recreation and, and the, in the environment and continue to improve our program. Off-road permits uh, were extremely high again this year, 4,901. You can see that that's gone quite, that's up, gone up steadily. Um, we are doing fee increases this year um, because we need to fund some capital improvement um, in the future years. So we are gonna look to our non-residents. You can see our non-residents go up and up every year. Um, so we are gonna look to those folks for the uh, the fee increase to help us with some capital improvement that we're planning in the next three or four years. Um, campers uh, continue to enjoy Sandy Neck. A lot of these are non-resident as well. We did a calculation, 71% of our RV campers are non-resident. So we're also gonna go up with those yeah. fees. Um, Escorts is uh, something that's super important. We want to keep um, our cottage owners from going past piping clovers, uh, if at all possible. So we have been repairing the marsh trail under active ongoing orders of conditions. And um, through that, we've been able to di uh, redirect many of our cottage owners to the marsh trail. Um, and our escorts are way down at just 18 for the whole year. And I think that's excellent because it keeps the staff free to do their other duties keeps the cottage owners happy because they don't have to wait for escorts. So I would say this is also a real win for us. The rest of this information, I'll just highlight some of the sort of interesting stuff. Um, campfires is becoming more and more popular at Sandy Neck. We have 455 permits. That's just on the public beach. There's also campfires on the off-road beach, which is part of the off-road vehicle permit. Um, we are looking to increase the fee for these campfire permits um weddings and special permits continue to increase since covid so we're kind of getting back on track with that we're we are going up for our wedding uh fees because you know 30 dollars for a wedding permit is pretty cheap um we're back on with our walks and talks uh, assistant park manager hannah lawrence does an excellent job and she also does a um, junior ranger program that we're actually seeing junior rangers that we graduated come back as staff. So that's extremely delightful to see. Um, we're back to our beach cleanups. Um, so we had a number of beach cleanups this year. Um, and then last but not least, we continue with our portable toilet program, which is in-house. In other words, we do have a staff member that goes out and handles those uh, portable toilets, which are extremely important for patron comfort and environmental protection. So. That is what I like to call my year on three pieces of paper. I'd be happy to answer any questions that you might have. I think you have a pretty good year and a good report too. Um, Commissioner, questions, John. John? John is yeah. muted. John, unmute yourself. I'm sorry, I was muted, I apologize. Um, I started to say you're a real asset, thank you, continue. <laughs> um, two separate questions, one deals with fees. I'm just curious as to whether the individual, whether resident or non-resident fees have uh, increased over those last three or four years and to what degree. And the second question I would ask at the same time is, uh, with regard to the wetlands West restoration, which I know you've been working on for a number of years, how much is done? What is the rate of recidivism that you have to keep going back at? And how much is left to do rough and rough numbers? So those two questions, Neil. All right, well, starting with the fees, our performer that we set up when we went to as, uh, when we converted to an enterprise account had the resident and non-resident fees going up every other year. Um, the residents were going up $5 and the non-residents were going up $10. So we've consistently been doing that for, for many years just to cover the increasing costs. Um, we decided to break that trend um, because we are expecting a very large capital uh, project for uh, addressing our erosion issues at Sandy Neck. Um, and it really came from looking at all the other beaches. Our, our non-resident permit fee was one was the 190 and Duxbury and um, and Nauset and Dennis and Plymouth. Oh, no, not Plymouth. Plymouth doesn't have non-resident. 
those three marquee beaches were in the $300 wow. for a non-resident permit. And so we're, and those beaches are not open the whole year. And that's why we have so many non-residents coming to us because so many other beaches are not open at the height of the summer. So we're not even near um, equal uh, with those beaches for non-resident fees. And we do need to raise capital. We need to raise quite a bit of capital to deal with our erosion issues. Um, and so that's where we're looking to. And, I, and I, it was, it, you know, the San Diego board approved it and was comfortable with that. With regard to restoration, um, the Phragmites is under control. Um, my colleague at the Nature Conservancy, Karen Lombard, did a paper about about this very topic. It's very interesting. So you take on these huge projects like we did. The two of us took it on back in the day. Um, you know, we thought we were going to cure Sandy Neck of Phragmites, and that would be that. And what her paper and our work together has shown is that you, you get to a point where it's maintenance, but you're never going to get out of maintenance. Uh, and so it's a it's a it's a, a small effort, but it's every year um, for the Phragmites, um, unless we have a big flood event, and then of course the the disturbance kicks that back up. These other species are are completely under control, uh, but again, it's maintenance for them as well. Um, I will I could go on and on about this particular topic, but this this rusty willow is is a really a really not nasty one, and that's around all your ponds. Yeah. And, and that one's going to take a while. That's the one I don't have in hand right now. Yeah. Do you get AmeriCorps or somebody to help with those projects? We do with the Rusty Willow. That's a chainsaw project. Um, they can't do the herbicide on, um, yeah. license, and they're not, but they certainly can help with a lot of the heavy lift of that. Okay. Thank you, Nina. Larry? Oh, thank you, Tom. Nina, it's great to see you again. Um, the, uh, I've really got two questions. I'd like to go back to the first page where your signature appears and the paragraph that begins, this is the sixth year. You talk about successfully deterring nesting pairs, and that's preceded by the Habitat Con Conservation Permit, HCP. Would you just explain for me, not knowing what it is, and other commissioners may also wonder, is there a link between the HCP and the deterring of pairs uh, deterring of nesting, rather, and is it structural? Do you just create barriers so that the plovers are deeper into the into the area where, where you prefer nesting? Could you give us some description of that? And I'll have one other question after that. Yeah, the habitat conservation um, plan is um, through the state. The state got a uh, acquired a Section 10 permit through the federal government, and then different agencies and organizations can buy into that through this HCP. Sandy Neck is on six years of that, and we're actually in the middle of renewing it. And through that permit, you can um, request a number of takes. There's mit a quite a heavy mitigation to be able to do this. Um, but the take is not necessarily, or isn't you know, killing an animal. It's maybe harassing, what would fall under harassing or affecting. Uh, a, a federally listed animal, the piping plover. And so when we uh, drafted our HCP, we chose deterring. Um, so what we do is it, the access trail comes out on the beach and then you know you turn right or east and that's where the ORV or corridor, the off-road vehicle corridor is. So what we're doing is we're trying to carve out a small section of beach there that never closes. So we are by using deterrence, which I'll explain in a second, we're trying to push the nesting activities east a little bit so that we always have some beach open. So what we do is we reduce the symbolic fencing. We use um, pallets that we place in the area where the plovers would be nesting. Um, so uh, we have flagging tape all over the place, you know, bouncing around. Um, we have the vehicle corridor right up in the nesting habitat, and all of that is permitted under this HCP. And then what we do is the area, so that's the first half a mile of beach, so my goal is always to have a half a mile of beach. And then past that half a mile of beach, I make the beach super inviting to nest in. So I get the fence way out, I try to keep it quiet, and I try to keep the birds out of one area and in another area, and it's been very successful. It, it's hard and not guaranteed, but it works so far. 
Okay, the other question I have is just, and your, your numbers are very impressive in two different ways from my point of view. First of all, it's great to see a five-year spread in, in, in rate changes or amount changes. And second of all, the growth and progress is wonderful. Recording in progress. And then the fact that you've kept such great records is also good. So my only question really is, of the total revenue of about 1.2 million plus, uh, is there any carryover for future, for future years uh, or not? Um, yeah, so that number, Larry, is above our revenue projections. So every year when I set my budget, my revenue projections match my expense projections. Okay. And so anything above that is surplus and gets put in our surplus account, which up until now has kind of been a rainy day account and also an account that I draw on for sand, which is extremely expensive to right. place in front of our dunes. That account is now going to be looked at for this uh, future capital improvement. Okay. That, that's, I don't, I don't know whether you feel you need to be giving us an update on that. I think it's, it's just great financial planning and, and handling. Um, if you feel it's something that we should know about, uh, I'll leave it up to you. But uh, otherwise, it's nice to know that you, you get it covered. So thanks a lot, Nina. Thank you, Larry. Luis? Uh, thanks, Tom. Uh, hi, Nina. Hi. Hi. Um, my question has to do with the uh, cottage lease fees. Mm -hmm. um, I, I presume this is above and beyond the... Uh, you just muted yourself, Louise. Great. Uh, my question has to do with the uh, uh, cottage lease fees. And uh, I, I presume that the 20, the uh, 20 uh, fiscal year 22 is averaged with the fiscal year 21, and it comes out to about what the other years were. So it's it's not really a blip it. Um, but my question is, is this above and beyond um, the real estate or property taxes that um, people out there pay? And, and what is it for? Yes, uh, thank you for that question. So there is kind of a weird, when you look at this matrix, um, part of that was there was rent forgiveness in fiscal year 21, which was COVID. So that's mm -hmm. why that number's low. And then fiscal year 22 was high because the fees are due right around the end of the fiscal year. So it kind of depends on where the, when the check lands. So it, does, it is confusing, but it does all kind of equal out. Yeah. To your other question, there are about uh, 25 cottages on Sandy Neck that are on public lands and therefore um, they have to rent the land. They're not renting the cottage. One of them is a cottage as well, but they're renting the land and that's what this fee is. And this fee goes into the enterprise account. They also are responsible for taxes and that goes into the general fund by law. So we don't actually see that those monies in the um, in the enterprise account. So is that used for uh, just, shall we say overhead associated with um, various services that they require from time to time or? What's the, what's the rationale? For the leases? Yeah, uh, for the fees. Well, it's a lease because they don't own the land, so they're they're basically renting the land. Right. Right. And so what do those funds do those? So those funds just go into the general pot? Is that it? So the, the fees that I'm presenting here go into the enterprise account. Mm -hmm. um, and then services provided to the cottage owners are numerous uh, that we've done cost of services for all the different user groups. Um, so services provided to cottage owners are all the administrative costs and then all the um, all the escorting uh, access issues. I mean, we, we do actually give cottage owners quite a bit of, of effort. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. George? Yes, uh, hi, Nina. Thanks so much for this. Uh, always a great report. Um, you did say, you know, that obviously usage is way, way up, and that's wonderful, and that uh, there really weren't uh, 
the citations weren't bad considering the amount of usage. Uh, what were most of the citations for? Um, a lot of our citations are people going on the beach without permits, dogs off leash, failure to air down. Those are kind of our bread and butter ones. Um, occasionally people driving on the trails, although that's less likely. Uh, but th that's the, the majority of them. Um, you know, the, the big issues, um, driving to endanger, uh, open container, minor possession, um, those those happen, but they're they're fewer and farther apart, and it's really sort of all associated with one or two big issues a year where we address with the police department. Yeah. This year, we do have a police liaison, Officer uh, Kelsey. Actually, the last two years, um, he's been our, our liaison for Sandy Neck, and that um, that uh, partnership has really helped. Um, I bet it has. Yeah, yeah, that's good. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Any more questions from the commissioner? None. Thank you, Nina. Thank you. Um, talk about liaison. Our town council liaison, Paula Snap, is with us too. Just want to mention it. Um, Hi, Paula. India. Hi, Paula. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Glad I got to hear the report on Sandy Neck. It was great to hear. Thank you. Yes. Always a high point of the year. Mm -hmm. We have two extension requests. The first one is Yasmin Realty Limited, SE3-5650. John? Yes, John O'Day, Sullivan Engineering Consulting, representing the applicant. Uh, this is a first request. This is a project that included maintenance dredging uh, and uh, took two plus years to get through the Army in Chapter 91, so they were just able to start that or do its first round the end of last winter. Um, I'd be happy to answer any questions. This is the first request. Any question from the commissioner? None. Could I have a motion to approve the extension request? So moved. Second. Roll call. Morin. Aye. Lee. Aye. Hearn. Aye. Foster. Aye. Abadili? Aye. Gilmore, aye. That's unanimous, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you. The second extension request is Manolia's Avenue Realty Trust, SC3-5118. Is Wayne here or, oh, Dan? Yeah. Um, yes, uh, Dan Ojula from Down Cape Engineering. Wayne's in the car. I, he, he's trying to uh, not kill himself, so I will, uh, I'll be able to. <laughs> Feel the call, but if he, if there is a question, he, he may be able to join us. Um, pretty straightforward. Um, this is Wayne's uh, personal house, and uh, we've been working on it, as you may recall, for a number of years. Um, unfortunately, there was a, a big uh, brush up over the access into the site. Um, there's a very small easement that feeds this, and they, they get into a legal battle, and the, the neighbors, we've been tied up in court. It's just finally settling now. And so Wayne has kind of been stopped from doing anything because it was just it was just not didn't make sense. Everything we everything we tried to do out there became a problem. So uh, we held off, but now we can start. And all of a sudden we realize we've got frost, and we're trying to do a little patio out front. So we're hoping to get just one more year uh, from the extension so that we can finish up that work. It's it's not a major project, but it's we're quite close to a resource area. So I'm sure you'd want to come in as a notice, and rather than refile the whole. Uh, uh, procedure again. We're, we're sure uh, would would look to you for a little bit of a break on that, so we could continue the work uh, for one more year. Uh, the site is generally quite stable. Um, the work that we're doing is 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 easily controlled under the uh, permit that you have. But um, we just uh, would like that extension so uh, we don't run out of time this year. I think it's about a month before we could have to stop, and we're just out of time this season. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Darcy, normally we only issue a three years term for the extensions, correct? Uh, yes, but um, we just told him to, he first was gonna ask for one, then he wanted to go with two, but if if you wanna give three. Yeah, I think I the, uh, administrations, administratively would be easy just to give them three and then, you know, if you finish one then you can file for the COC stuff, done. 
whatever the board, whatever the commission's pleasure. We, we just need a little more time on it, and we'll button it right up. But, but thank you. Okay, John. Yeah, just uh, te technically, I, I know personally that there's a very minor amount of work left for for Kirk to do, so it's pretty simple. But just from a administrative point of view, the paperwork submitted in two years. Uh, Agenda says one year, so there's a little discrepancy there. So maybe we should go for the three years, Darcy, if it's easier for you. Well, actually, Kim reposted the agenda to make it the two years. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. 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 So do you want to go the two years or three years, Darcy? Um, I, I'm happy with the three years. Okay. Any other question from the commissioner? None. We have a motion to approve the extension request for three years. So, so moved. Second. Roll call. Abedili. Aye. Foster. Aye. Gilmore. Aye. Hearn. Aye. Lee. Aye. Morin. Aye. That's unanimous, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Good luck. Thank you very much, Wayne. We're all set. Appreciate you logging on. Thank you. Yep. We have four revised plan. The first one is Janet Holian, SE3-5858. John. Uh, good afternoon, John O'Day from Sullivan Engineering Consulting, representing the applicants at uh, 250 Windswept. I can um, share my screen if that's okay. Yep. And I can bring up the, uh, so on the screen now should be the approved, originally approved plan. There was a um, master bedroom addition basically on the south side of the house in the 50 to 100 foot buffer and a garage on the north side of the house. Um, the revised plan is requesting um, a little deck area off of this master bedroom outside of the 50 foot buffer outside of the work limit. Um, the garage ended up not getting built on this corner. It's been pulled off and detached and not in the buffer zone or flood zone or anything. Um, but up in this corner, they would like to have an addition which consists of, you know, partially of a three season room. Uh, it has been designed also outside the 50 foot buffer. And along the middle part of the existing house, uh, looking for a couple steps off of the um, living room, these two little lines here. We did update the mitigation calculations. And so um, these areas were adjusted accordingly. And I think with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Any question from the commissioner? I do. Bill? <laughs> yeah, I, I may have it wrong, but it looked to me like there, there were some steps that were in the zero to 50 that were not mitigated. Um, I have a question about that. Otherwise, it seemed like the project was consistent with our uh, our bylaw. Uh, I believe I did include those in the mitigation calculations. Uh, I see that I added the proposed step. Uh, so I may have missed the part that, you know, this very this small corner of that step is within the 50 where the rest right is. it's basically accounted for uh maybe i'm a square foot or two short and if that's really a problem we can trust that and maybe i was over already i was, <laughs> I was over 20 square feet anyway so i don't know whatever you want to do any other question from the commissioner? None. John, are you over or under? I have more than, I'm 20 square feet excess of mitigation. Okay. Um, could I have a motion? Could I have, Just, a, motion to could I have a motion to approve this? John, Mr. Chairman. Uh, yep. John's got his hand up. Uh, John. Yeah, I'm sorry, Tom, to jump in, but um, I, I think it would help, John, to, just for accuracy, if you, I'm okay with it, but with the mitigation, but just revise the plan to reflect the error that Bill correctly pointed out. 
So just revise those calculations and send it into Darcy, just for the record, okay? I would be fine with that. Other than that, I'm fine with the mitigation because it exceeds what you need. Can I have a motion to approve this revised plans subject to receipt of a revised plan showing the um, the arrow pointing to the proper mitigation area? So moved. Second. Roll call. Abedili? Aye. Foster? Aye. Warren? Aye. Lee? Aye. Hearn? Aye. Gilmore? Aye. That's unanimous. Thank you. Thank the you. second revised plan is Slow Marsh Wants Nominal Trust. Um, this is SC3 5638. Um, this is for John again. It is, uh, John. Actually, all from, the revised plans are yours. Yeah, I'll take care of all of them. <laughs> um, so I have before you the uh, plan that was originally approved with this project. It was a house and a detached garage. Um, about a year after the original approval, a revised plan was submitted where they eliminated the garage. They thought it was too close to a beach tree out in the driveway in the landward side of the house. But they added uh, a patio area outside the back and a patio area on the side and walkways all around the house. Uh, house has been constructed, side patio is in uh low this outer lower patio is not in these walkways are not in uh the revised plan is seeking to bring the garage back into the approval uh and so again these areas of patio and walkway have been eliminated this revised plan is a reduction in square footage within the 50 foot buffer from what was last approved here. Um, it is a slight increase in the uh, 50 to 100 foot buffer. The commission accepted this as a mitigation constrained site. Um, and so for this garage, there would be a little bit of a net um, monetary uh, that we would be owing the commission uh, if assuming you'd be willing to approve this. And uh, I think with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Questions, John? Uh, John, it looks like as I compared the, the old to the new, it looks like the property line was changed um, in an agreement, I assume, with the abutter. Uh, so I had two questions. Number one, if you look at it, the shed is half on this guy's property and half on the neighbor's property. And I was kind of curious about that. And the second question is, with the increase in property, is there room to add the mitigation on site rather than fee and lieu of because of the increase in the property? So there was actually, uh, it was a trade with the abutting parcel. Um, these are both undersized lots to begin with, so they have to trade square footage for square foot. So the, the lot is not getting any bigger, and the area that they gained for the garage is basically outside of the 50-foot buffer. Um, it is, yeah. So I don't think that we've gained any real room for mitigation. We did in the original approvals you know, in addition to the in lieu fees, have a pretty good restoration plan of the bank and buffer, which has, you know, been implemented. Actually, too, and as I looked at it, I have to kind of agree with that because the mitigation area that we want is where you already had the earlier mitigation. Right. You know, putting it in the back land doesn't help a lot. John, looking at this plan, do we have to in the file, Darcy? The proposed, the, the plan that was just on the screen is the proposed, is what's before you today. Sorry, this plan? Yeah, but I was just comparing on the applications one that I don't, I don't see that plan. That's why, that's why my questions, the property line. 
it just kind of changed a little bit. The property line but, did change so that they could fit this garage without impacting the the beech tree, which is right. why it's been eliminated the last time. So we, this is the the trade of land up in this area. So Darcy, do we have this record showing the change of the property line? I'm going to have to look at the laser fish filing. I don't understand the question though. Me neither. This is, okay. <laughs> this is, this, these lines in this plan, I guess that this is the first time that you are seeing these property lines is this plan revision. Correct. Okay. So that's why I was looking at the application. The application does not have the plan showing the new property line. I'm not this sure. revised does. Right. Okay. So, Larry? Uh, my question really uh, follows what uh, John Ambedili and John O'Day are both saying. Uh, the ones that I'm looking at, unless it's hidden in here somewhere, I'm looking at the date of the revised plan. So let's, let's, I know, Tom, that's something you always like to verify. So I want to make sure we're looking at the right one. And what I'm looking at is one dated uh, uh, November 15th of 2021, uh, where the garage was added back. Is that the one we're looking at, John O'Day, for purposes, or is there a different date that we should be considering? That is the plan. It was probably a typo and should have been 2022. Um, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll let you make that change. And then uh, are there... Are there still, other than the garage, are there still other structural things to be done? And that would include vegetation. Uh, in other words, are we still dealing with an as-built sort of thing, or are we dealing with additional things remaining to be completed structurally? The house, everything is complete, really, besides this garage. Besides, besides the garage. Is the other areas of patio and walkway. So, so assuming that... that this is approved and we're not going back to other areas of patio and walkway, then everything else around the house is done. Okay, all right, that, that, that clarifies. Well, I'll let you submit a corrected date on the plan to staff, whatever you'd like to do. And I, that, that's the only question I had. I think otherwise we've covered the issue pretty well. Thank you. Bill? Yeah, this is a uh, long running project that predates my involvement with the Conservation Commission. In, you know, if I had seen it, and this was a new project, I would have a problem with it. Um, there's a huge impact with the, I mean, not impact, you know, footprint in the zero to 50. And you're involved with the, you know, it was mit mitigation constrained and there's the in lieu fee thing. And then you have to change and you got rid of a garage and you did some other things and now you're putting in a garage and it's it's so it's a, it's it's a project that um i don't like but it's a project that the commission has has um you know been, been has approved going along we're now doing a revision and because it's a revision i i am inclined to just abstain in the vote i just want you to know why when the vote happens i'm just abstaining i'm not opposing it's just how it's got a long history it has a long history, and I'm not part of that. <laughs> I understand. John, sorry, the question, because I found the drawing now <clears throat> on the file. So this is uh, this is the date of November the 15th. Yes. Is that correct? It is November the 15th. Should, is it? That should be 22, right, instead of 21? Should be 22. Okay. Um, George. George. Yes, uh, I, just so so Bill knows, this does have a long history, but um, I respect what these people have done because that beech tree that's out the front there is a magnificent tree, and and had they had they gone ahead with the original plan to build that garage, it would have, would have been a problem, and they've gone through a great deal of machination here it seems to me changing property lines and all in order to get this garage back but and save that beach tree because it, it's a it's quite a it's quite a tree bill 
Larry, do you have any more questions? Well, I, I just want to give give a little background that might help Bill in his uh, uncertainty. Um, this property, the exist the previous house was right on the edge of that bank, and this house we had to go through. I remember it vividly going back more than once for site visits there, and it was uh, a situation where uh, creating a new structure. Uh, on the existing footprint was something that was pursued, and I believe it was very close to that footprint. But in the process, also was a bank there that we had to deal with in vegetation. So the issues that we wrestled with, Bill, are no less than what we would be doing now, in my opinion. We went through it thoroughly then. We had to show some flexibility, which we did. Uh, and in that regard, uh, it's obvious that the the property owner as well as the consultant have kept that in mind because these are sensible changes. And uh, so I think that hopefully that would uh, put your mind somewhat at ease. You could vote if you'd like or abstain if you'd like, but that that's my re recollection of it. I, if, yeah, I'd just like to say that, you know, this is a revised plan. I mean, this is, that's like a wholly different um, category of project. And I, I personally feel like my voting yes i'm sort of being, yeah the whole plan you're basically you have this plan and i think the way it came out i i get that they made they, they've done something they've changed the lot line great they've saved the beech tree yes all of that's good this iteration is good but i think overall it's kind of like i don't know I, that i would have gone along with this project and i don't want to like yeah the revised plan is good i'm going with the plan so that's why I just don't want to vote on this project. Just want you to understand. I mean, <laughs> yep, yep, understand, Bill. Hey, Ready for a motion, Tom? Yep. Could I have a motion to approve the revised plan subject to a receipt of a revised plan showing the proper revision date? So moved. Second. Second. Roll call. Abadili. Aye. Foster. Aye. Gilmore, aye. Hearn. Abstain. <laughs> Lee. Aye. Morin. Aye. Uh, that motion carries, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you. The next revised plan is Robbins Walk SC 3 5871 John. Uh, yes, John Day, Sullivan Engineering. I'll bring up uh, the plans. So uh, again, this is the this was a project that was uh, demolishing uh, a house that was really probably out in it, just just flirting with the buffer zone, constructing a new dwelling um, that straddled the hundred foot buffer, and a sort of garage area was outside of the buffer zone, and a yard and landscaping. Um, the revised plan has um, made the house a little bit smaller. So you can see the, uh, in the dash line, and I think a highlighted version where the house had been before. So in terms of what's actually within the 100 foot buffer, I think we're basically smaller. There's an, a wetland isn't even on our property, undisturbed 50 foot buffer to it from the side um did add uh, a patio area out in the yard looks to be about 75 feet or so from the wetland might have been something that could have been um minor activity or staff review if this was all here but uh we just submitted the entire package for your consideration i'd be happy to answer any questions question from the commissioner Seeing none, can I have a motion to approve the revised plans as submitted? I move. Second. Second. Roll call. Morin. Aye. Lee. Aye. Hearn. Aye. Gilmore, aye. Foster. Aye. Abadili. Aye. It's unanimous. The last revised plan is AAR Legacy SE3 5825. John. So this is a project that was for uh, 
renovation, restoration of an old house, and then um, some pool and pool cabana uh, located next to it off of Old Close Road by Cordwood Landing. Um, there was some dead trees at the at the beginning of this project that were part of the original consideration over this past uh, construction is is well underway on all aspects of it uh over this past summer they've continued to work with bartlett on a on a program for trying to you know make sure they're preserving the trees that are in good shape uh, but have also identified some trees that are um in not good shape and in pro close proximity to the house uh, and they were meeting out there had some meetings with staff out there and it was recommended that this be brought back to the commission uh, and included in that a um, additional trees offered in the replanting plan um, and so that is the plan that's before you these are old um, pine trees that are in poor health uh, they have zero impact on the existing view um, they are in an area of other pine trees which they are working to try to keep from becoming infested with with um, bugs and they have come up with uh, offering replacement trees in the same general areas of, of where those coming down are um, the other items that are shown on this landscape plan is requesting fencing along Cordwood Road uh, and a rinse station uh, off the side of the house. And I think with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Any question from the commissioner? Just if Darcy can comment, she was out there. Darcy. Uh, staff is good with it. It was actually a meal that went out to this one. Um, I did want to note that um, oh, your your plan has a proposed outdoor shower. Usually, we want to have it labeled as a rinse station. We can do that. Okay. Yeah. I noticed in your letter you called it a rinse station, but just so. Luis. Uh, I'm, I'm looking at the plan, a list of, um, plants, et cetera. Is, is there any kind of, uh, information <clears throat> about the, the height or caliper of those trees? You're taking down big trees, so <clears throat> we wouldn't want just really small ones going in. Uh, so the trees that are going back in are um, seven to eight foot uh, cedars, seven to eight foot pitch pine, uh, 15 gallon oak, which I would estimate to be in that same sort of height range. Um, <clears throat> Those are the trees that have been added to the plan. How do we feel about <clears throat> putting in uh, pitch pine uh, into an environment where there is a problem with bugs? <clears throat> Darcy, are you all right with that? Um, we do. We do have it on the the list. Um, you have your landscape person here today, John. I thought they were going to be, but I don't know. Well, it seems like, I mean, it, it may be on the list, but it seems like uh, you wouldn't want to add those to an environment that is already uh, compromised by, by bugs. I think we had like a, actually like a black pine, Japanese pine on our list. You want to? See if you want to switch. Uh, John mentioned things. pitch pine, so that's what I'm reacting to. No, I'm we, meaning we can we can check in with um, both Bartlett Tree to see how they what their reaction to is, as, as well as the landscaper, and if they feel like switching to a different kind of pine would be better. Um, 
we can okay. maybe work that out with staff. Right. I'm fine with that. If you are, Darcy. Yes, sounds good. Any other question from the commissioner? So could I have a motion to, to approve this revised plans but subject to the review of the staff in terms of the pitch pine or the other types of pine that to be to be placed in this project so moved well in sub subject to a revision for labeling we could have it labeled as a rinse station so yes. the uh, approval the subject to station. further revision yep second the motion roll call have a dealing aye Foster? Aye. Gilmore, aye. Vernon? Aye. Lee? Aye. Morin? Aye. That's unanimous. And for the record, Mr. Chairman, John. for the record, Mr. Chairman, Darcy Carley is present in the quorum. And is Emil also part of the quorum, Darcy? I, I, I think he, that. I don't think he's going to be discussing anything, but. Okay. Um, <clears throat> So just, just for the record, on. Darcy, Darcy, yep. you are here. Yes, yeah. thank I am here. I am present now. <laughs> <laughs> Peter is still not here yet. No. Okay. And oh, and just so you know, um, Ed is Ed is on, but he was having trouble with with uh, video. Right. But he can show the search, he can share the screen, but not his camera. Yes. So the next item in the afternoon is the enforcement order. We have five of them. The first one is Graham Robert and Lisa C. Walters, 38 Washington Avenue, Osterville, map 162, parcel 002, alterations of the buffer to a wetland resource area, Crystal Lake and bordering vegetated wetland by maintaining an unpermitted beach. This is table from November the 1st at Good afternoon, Chair Lee and members of the commission. On behalf of Graham and Lisa Walters, Michael Schultz, for the record, uh, with me this uh, afternoon, I do have what, John O'Day of Sullivan Engineering. I know, understand, I understand. Ed, I mean, I want to act to go first. Oops. I'm okay, I'm, I'm sorry. I got a minor, minor technical difficulty here. I'll be right there again. Yep. Right. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, just so people see where we are here. Um, this area is looking familiar to you. Uh, you're right. Uh, you did hear a notice of intent for a raise and replace of, of the house uh, at this site uh, back in, I think it was late summer, I think it was July. I think it was sometime in July. Um, so this is the the area an aerial photo from 2020 uh, from the arc reader our arc reader um, database. Uh, the issue, uh, and if you remember hearing uh, back for the notice of intent, uh, you had approved the project for uh, for the house or, you know for, for the house to be uh, replaced. Um, there was a lot of debate at the time as to whether or not there was a, this, the sand area. I believe it was originally labeled as a beach. Um, there was some rather extensive discussion as to whether or not, in fact, it was a legal beach. Uh, and as a result, uh, you approved the project, but asked for a revised plan that showed uh, that this uh, sandy, the, the, the sandy area is not permitted and subject to further review. Uh, the enforcement order is essentially uh, the result of that further further review. So uh, when uh, I looked at it, and I looked at it um, and found that we have not been able to find any uh, supporting evidence that, that would convince us that there was a pre-existing uh, beach area to this, to this uh, property. <clears throat> um, we've looked through aerial photos, and uh, we we have not been able to, to support that uh, support that assumption. So uh, it does look as though you can see on the left. This is a, a an aerial photo from 2008, and you can see the whole area in here. Uh, 
is is rather bare and uh, uh, barren. And then over here in 2000, some, sometime in 2011, 2012, uh, there's this uh, sandy, more sandy area that that uh, shows up. Uh, you can also see the picture on the left is an ancestors of an ancestor photo uh, taken uh, again looking out toward the toward the beach where the beach area is. Uh, there is no uh, sign of a beach at this point uh, from this from this angle. Um, and again, this is what it looks like uh, currently today. Uh, I was out. I did look and go out, and again uh, this afternoon uh, to see if I could find another another uh, or any, any other uh, viewpoint. But again, from this standpoint or from this viewpoint on the on the property, uh, I was not seeing any. Not, I could clearly see a beach, and again from the same same point, I'm not seeing anything in this from this 2008 photo. So. Uh, I, again, I don't. I don't believe there's enough uh, evidence to support that there was a pre-existing beach at any point um, prior to 1973, at least. So, uh, what we've asked is that the beach, uh, the sand area, uh, be re be removed, or uh, the the uh, homeowners can go through the process of trying to seek uh, permitting for the for a beach area, uh, with no guarantee as to success on that one. Uh, if they remove the area, remove the, the sand, uh, then they will have to submit a restoration, so stabilize the site, and then submit a restoration plan uh, that comes along with monitoring uh, for several years after that. So with that, unless you have any, if anybody has any questions, and I, I know uh, Attorney Schultz would like to uh, make a comment as well. Let me go to the commissioner first. Any commissioner has any questions? Larry? Uh, I do, but I'd like to hear uh, Mike Schultz's pitch first. He, he may have an approach on behalf of his, his client that may uh, come up with some other alternatives that uh, have not yet been stated. Maybe not. Uh, but uh, I'd like to do that and then come back later to reserve any questions I may that remain unanswered by me. Thank you. Thank you. Louise? Uh, looking at the uh, photographs from 2008 and, and comparing now, it's hard to tell, but um, have there been uh, major trees that have been removed in the interim, Ed? Uh, I didn't see any, any uh, real uh, indication that there had been trees that had been taken down in the area. Okay, thank you. Bill? Um, I would, I would just like to address the whole concept of putting sand on beaches right up against a pond. I, I think from a, I don't know, public education standpoint, it's worth, you know, why, why do we care? And I think it's worth stating that a grassy buffer, having grass is a better filter for pollutants, whether it be nutrients or sediments or whatnot. And the potential to have sediment wash into the pond is greater and the pollutants can be washed in. And I, I don't know if, uh, Ed, did you, have you addressed that to them? I don't know, but it, I think it's worth stating why we're, we care. I mean, I've, I've uh, dealing, been dealing exclusively with, uh, with Chuck from, um, Sullivan. So, uh, I mean, he, he certainly understands the concept of why we have an issue with uh, with putting sand in like that. Um, but I have not had any direct uh, contact with the homeowner. Okay. Thanks. Like Ed said from the from the beginning, is in the last applicate last time when they came in front of us, we approved the projects, but then we have a question about whether the justifications for a sandy beach and how can they justify it. That's why we did not approve the beach. And we direct the staff to look into the justification, whether it can be justified or not. So the answer come back is not at this point, so. Excuse me, Tom? Yeah, Darcy. Yeah, uh, thank you. Um, I and I just wanted to weigh in here that I was the one 
who noticed this during the um, the notice of intent application um, for the house. And one of the things that struck me was so much sand had been added, um, you know, placed on this man-made beach that it was actually eroding down into the lake. So that was a concern that I had. And um, I was first to review the aerials. Um, I could not find any aerials that supported that this this ever existed either. And then I had Ed go over them to, for, as a you know second look see. So I just wanted to state that, that there was a lot of sand on this beach. Thank you, Nancy. If not, I'm going to alternate these shows. Mike. Uh, good afternoon, Mr. Chair. Again, for the record, uh, members of the commission, Michael Schultz on behalf of Graham and Lisa Walter. Um, so in looking at the, or the enforcement order that was sent uh, to the, the Walters, um, it was from Edwin Hoops, and it said that um, after investigating, it did not appear as though the beach was permitted and that no evidence uh, that the beach predated the Wetlands Protection Act in 1973. Um, I would respectfully submit to the commission that in 1961, the house was constructed at the site. So this is a developed site along Crystal Lake uh, that has had some uh, quite some history. That was certainly uh, pre-Wetlands Protection Act, very similar to the Wiena Club, which might be a couple of doors down that, that has an existing beach. Um, Pre-Wetlands Protection Act, there was nothing governing it. It was very similar, uh, very, uh, very common for people to construct a beach. If Ed is able to share the screen, or so I'm able to go through the 1970, 1968 photograph, is that possible, Ed? Uh, yeah, hold on, sorry. So you know, uh, I, I put all of your your attachments into one, I just scanned into, scanned it into the, the computer. I, I feel like didn't really even have time to do that, but um, here it comes. So it's all it's all in, in one uh, fell swoop there. So just let me know where you need to, where you need to go. Oh, super. Um... Am I able to, still scrolling down a little bit, are you able to see my cursor or not? No, it's only mine. Okay, are so you? there we go. So right there, uh, thank you, Ed, where you are, where uh, what appears to be a boat or a chair, um, I would suggest to the commission that you can see a horseshoe shape that is very similar to uh, what is existing for the present beach uh, today. And if Ed can, it goes from that um, from that boat, it touches the blue line and then goes back to the lake. No, a little bit shorter. Um, I wish you could see my, my cursor. Um, but Chuck from Sullivan Engineering does have a line that's going right to the center of it um, that does, at least in my opinion, evidence exactly right there. Yeah, thank you, Ed. Again, that's a 1968 aerial photography uh, from the town of Barnesville website. Um, and depending upon, I think it's in, in a spring photograph. So again, we're not dealing with green grass and the stark colors that have been presented by town staff that really depict the sand color in the green grass color. In 1973, if we're able to scroll down, Ed, to the affidavit of Michael Lally, um, the Lallies owned 38 Washington Avenue from 1973 until uh, 2014. Continuous ownership, it was in the Lally family. Uh, Michael was 16 years old when the property was purchased. So he was uh, very aware of the surroundings. He lived there um, in his affidavit in paragraph five does say that he was 16 years old when his parents purchased the property and the beach area was in the location that it is today. Again, I would suggest to the commission that that's evidence uh, that it existed uh, pre-Wetlands Protection Act. Over the years, uh, Michael did, Michael Lally did move out of the property in 1974, uh, uh, but over the years from 1974 until 2014, he would frequently visit his parents during uh, their ownership and they would maintain uh, by raking 
um, that, that beach area. Um, again, the Lally's owned it from 1973 until 2014 uh, when they sold it to Ed, uh, Ned Crosby, Edward M. Crosby, if we're able to scroll down a little bit. Um, and we do have, I do have the deeds that are appended um, from the Lally's evidencing their ownership of the property. Um, exhibit two is a photograph. If we could stop there briefly. Again, that's when they sold it. Um, it does exist pretty clearly. And again, depending of the time of year, I'd like to have the commission note that the starkness in the grass, right, that the grass is dead around it. It blend, it, it does blend in, but you can see it. Um, if we're able to scroll down a little bit, Ed, thank you. Um, that was in 2021. Again, time of year, we're able to see the green grass, the stark difference between the two. Ed, if you're able to scroll down a little bit. And this is the photograph that was appended from, we've seen this photograph from the town um, as evidence that the beach did not exist. Um, again, Michael Lally does point out in his affidavit, as does Ned Crosby, um, if we look at the time of year, the coloration of the grass and the angle on which the photograph is taken, impossible to see a beach. Um, if we're able to scroll down. So this is an affidavit from Ned Crosby. That he owned the property. He purchased it from the Lallies. Um, when he rented a house across the, across the lake in 2013 and 2014, when he was looking at purchasing properties, he would sit on that, on the dock at the property across the lake and the, the beach would light up depending uh, when it was later in the afternoon and it would light up on the beach. That's what, um, enticed him to make an offer. He purchased the property in 2014 from, uh, from the Lallies. And he, is, he and his family would utilize the beach uh, in that location, same location as uh, the Lallies from 2014 until 2021 when they purchased it or when they sold it. Uh, he understood that when he purchased it, that Lallies had maintained that beach from 19, at least 1973. Um, we're able to scroll down a little bit. Uh, Ned does offer, we'll go up to paragraph seven. Uh, thank you. Ed, um, again, in paragraph seven, uh, Ned Crosby does point out the, the angle on the photograph in February of 2008, that it would be impossible to see, um, you know, any beach, it's the incorrect angle. And he does offer an interesting opinion that, you know, the inability um, for earlier aerial photographs, let's say the 1968 photograph or others to depict a beach, um, might be due to the time of year when different storms blow uh, debris across the lake. Something I didn't know, uh, but someone that's familiar with uh, the water like Ned uh, would know that. Um, to address uh, just a couple of comments, um, Ned does also note in his affidavit um, going to uh, Darcy uh, Darcy's comment about so much sand being added it, during Ned's ownership of the property, which uh, ceased in 2020, 2021, no sand was added um, by him during his ownership of the property. No, uh, no sand was added by uh, Michael Lally or his family during their ownership of the property. How they would maintain it is raking it with a simple garden rake and, and maintaining that area. Um, Based on that, I would uh, respectfully submit that, that evidence has been presented that the beach existed pre-1973 and pre uh, the Wetlands Protection Act and would uh, ask that the commission rescind the order. But thank you. Thank you, Mike. Um, question from the commissioner, Larry. You're muted, Larry. There you go. Um, I'll ask either Mike or 
uh, Ed, to respond to these. But first of all, are there, other, there was mentioned that there was another beach up the way uh, on this lake owned by um, the Riano Club. Are there any other beaches on this lake? I did see some private docks and piers that were of small small size on the opposite side. But are there any are there any other um, uh, sandy areas that have been before the commission before? Um, let me just ask that question and let's see where the answers go. Then I'll go to another question. Um, Michael Schultz, uh, Mr. Morin, I do know that uh, if you're looking from the property out the, towards the water, the Wiano Club would be to the left. They do have uh, that beach. And if you go to the right, there is a beach a couple doors down. Okay. All right. Thank you, Mike. Um, the second question I have, Ed, is that you have uh, offered in this situation that they remove the sand by a date certain, which is uh, really next week or this week, or that they're given a, into time into January to file an NOI. Um, is uh, Could you tell me the criteria that you use to determine whether they have that option, or is there no criteria that's specifically involved? You're just enabling it for them. Uh, so certainly, uh, so just, just to remember, uh, this was actually supposed to be heard last month at last month's enforcement hearing. Uh, it was tabled because Attorney Schultz had just been hired uh, literally a day or two before the, the uh, hearing uh, in November. And he had asked for uh, some some time to, to study the matter. So uh, that's why that's the issue with the dates. In terms of the uh, permitting, uh, this is not there. There are no there's no uh, uh, circumstances that are are preventing them from asking for that uh, because there are no, uh, there's certainly no natural heritage uh, issues uh, with any of the habitat. Uh, it's not, it's neither uh, priority nor uh, estimated habitat. So uh, this would be something that they could, they could uh, appeal to the board for and, uh, and possibly, um, possibly, and, I, and that's, I, I always stress to make sure, make sure they understand they're only seeking to uh, to get permission to to um, permit a beach, it's not it's not a guarantee. I, I think that that answer is very uh, persuasive. It, it gives us some basis upon which uh, an alternative can be offered, uh, and uh, I appreciate that response. And uh, that pretty much concludes my questions uh, on this matter for now. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. Did I hear that no sand was added by the lollies, who are the current owners, nor was sand added by the landowner, whose name I forget, who preceded the lollies? Is that right? Is that what it you was, said? Uh, Mr. Hearn, Michael Schultz, it was um, Ned Crosby and Michael Lally, the two that did not add any sand. and. Uh, neither did my client. So no sand has been added. No sand has been added. And your client, who, the, the current owner is who? I'm sorry. Graham, Graham and Lisa Walters. Okay, so they have not added sand? They have I, not. They haven't. The Lallies haven't. The, so if that's true, then it seems... <laughs> I'm wondering about the efficacy of the uh, order because no one is really putting sand down. It's sand that's there. Um, that being said, I mean, sand is not good. It's, it's, you know, it's a pollutant, blah, blah. I could go on about that. But if people are not putting sand down and sand has not been placed, then I'm, I'm left thinking, is this an appropriate um, order to remove the sand, which has basically gone back three, I don't know, I'm just thinking out loud here. It's like, it's a, I, I was thinking somebody had the sand down very recently and, well, we've got to do something about it. And it's like, wait a minute, that's just sand that's been there for three owners. I mean, it, so. it seemed that Mr. way Church. to me when I was there. I just want to state, I was the one that went out there and there was a lot of sand on this beach and it was gullying over there was like a small wooden i think there's a rail or something but there was enough sand 
I can't imagine if this was all just like a natural beach going back to 1968, a sandy area, and nobody ever added any with what I was seeing on the day I was there. I, I, yeah, I, I think what happens is when, when it's raked up, Darcy, and I think what you see at, at any other beach on a slope is, you know, what it will run off. I didn't see anything. I've been up to the beach as well and not really seeing, you know, anything that was what would evidence lots of sand washing into the, the beach into the water. But I going back to Larry's comment, you know, maybe there's some way that, that the commission might find if, um, you know, Putting something that, that might help prevent that runoff, whether it's a whether it's angling, whether it's a, a more helpful retaining wall. So wanted to, um, to to put that out there for the commission. Thank you, John. Yeah, I, it seems to me, guys, that the, you know it's a long-standing commission decision that a pre-existing beach can be maintained um, with one commissioner, a new commission descending from that, but that's a separate issue. It's clear that that has been this commission's policy up till now. So the basic question before us is whether we believe that this beach was pre-existing based on Councilor Schultz's evidence and testimony, or do we believe from the evidence and testimony submitted by Ed and Darcy, where there was no evidence to substantiate that it pre-existed? So, so, so it's kind of like, Councilor, you know, it's just a matter of fact to be determined by the commission. Um, it's not a matter of the principles. I think that's really well established. The concern I have as I try to understand those two sides of this argument is when I looked at the pictures, it looked like there was some metal, um, that metal barrier surrounding the beach to keep it in place. Is, is that right, Ed, as I looked at that picture? Yes, there, there's like some, some sort of a metal landscaping, uh, a material that's that's keeping it it's sort of like edging the where the lawn is and so it's separating the lawn from the from the sand area which leads me to believe that somebody has been maintaining that or done work on it other than counselors you said raking it periodically um and i'm sort of bothered by that picture relative to trying to resolve the question of of uh, what is the true history of this of this sand um so I kind of go back to Ed and Darcy and ask him, in light of Councilor Schultz's presentation, has that in any way affected your your uh, analysis, Ed and or Darcy? Right. If, if I may, I'm going to share a picture. This was taken on site uh, this afternoon at 1.30 p.m. Okay, this was from, if you remember this, sort of look at this because I can't show you both, both screens at the same time, but. You can see, clearly see, here is a beach right here, okay? And now if you remember, go go back to the, uh, I to, I'm sorry, I have to switch my screen here. So if we go back, this is the, more or less the same same, same angle. So you can see again, no sand, and the other one was with sand. So I mean, in my eyes, uh, yes, you would be able to see at least a portion of the sand. Uh, granted, the angle is going to be slightly different. I tried to do my best with getting that getting that same look, but. Um, you know, clearly you would be able to see a little bit of sand if that if that beach had existed in 2008, and I just don't see it. I, that's that's why I, that was my whole point behind this whole thing. And what is that thing to the to the yeah. left there of the picture? Is that like a boat that was sitting there? Uh, that's my question too, John. If you go back to uh, that here? picture, as you look at where the beach yep, was, where or was not. Right what's that? Now. Yeah, what's that? This, I, I think it's a, a like a pack or a, a board of some sort, maybe a, a paddleboard. I, I don't know for a fact. Um, I wasn't sure. It's, it's from 2008, so so I'm just assuming that it looks kind of like some sort of like a paddleboard or a, a kayak or something. Okay, so some kind of a boat probably or kayak or something. Okay, thank yeah. you. Can, yeah. Ed, can you flip back to that other photo for a minute? 
Yeah, hold on. That's the current photo, right? This is yeah. This is from this afternoon, and you yeah. can see here's the rail, the handrail that's going down toward yeah. the toward the pond. Right. And then here's the sand. The sand. Yeah. And I would, I mean, I for a frame of reference, keep your eye on that, on this Sweet. tree. That's the one that's that's most obvious and everything. Thanks, Ed. George, do you have any more questions? Uh, not at the moment, thank you. Is there a way I can show a uh, share my screen now? Uh, like, I want to show this one picture that I took in June. Um, let's yeah, see. I, yeah, co-host, you can share yep. the screen. Ed, stop sharing so I can. Yeah, this this is yeah. how much sand was there, and it was going over the top of this area. Yeah. Um, let me just go back one. Yeah, and this is, to me, this looked like this this was new, the yeah. metal thing. And I, I don't know how to describe it, but this this was like thick with sand. I don't. Oh. Okay. The, I have another question, Tom. If I can yeah, follow up. Yep. Uh, Counselor, I mean, we you saw erosion of the sand there. You saw that picture Darcy just showed where there was clearly eroding sand. And you're, you're saying over the last... 20 or 30 years, nobody has added sand to that. That strikes no. me as being hard to accept that. No, I don't know how you saying, explain that. I'm saying for 48 years, you have two people that are well respected in the community that are telling you um, that no sand was added. Um, and yet, again, I, again, just looking at those pictures, testimony that there has been eroding sand, you, you said so yourself. Um, I, I mean, somebody must have been adding sand or doing work on that. I mean, I mean, just the metal there that's there, that's new. And yet there's evidence of eroding sand and it's still full of sand. So factually, I'm having trouble understanding how how they could be. I mean, it just seems to me somebody has been adding sand there, just logically on its base. No, I think when you when you rake sand, um, Mr. Abadili, it, it creates the, the appearance, right? It softens the sand and that if it rains, it would erode. So again, it's not my testimony. It's someone uh, that there were two individuals of continuous ownership from 1973 and, until 2014. Well, okay, thank you. Attorney Schultz, I'm wondering, do, you know, for those two persons that gave you the testimony, do, do they have any photo that can show the beach at that time? I mean, yeah, you know, uh, Chair, Chairman Lee, that, that's a great point. I did ask um, Mr. Lally, he is going through uh, his records. He does, his parents live there. He was hoping to find um, some photographs for the commission today of his mother on the beach. So um, I'm hoping that, that those do come and maybe it makes sense because I do have a, um, I, I would like to produce that evidence to the commission that you know, in, in fact, it did exist. And here are some photographs uh, from the Lally family that that evidence the, the mother on the beach. Or even Crosby. Or exactly. So, um, you know, I, I think that might be very helpful. Might a, I don't know when the commission's next uh, enforcement um, hearing is. I don't want it to go out too long, but might, that might be helpful to the commission if I can present that to you. Because as it's, as it's written right now, Ed is asking whether to remove the sand or alternatively, you can file for the, for the beach under the NOI. So, you know, you can file it and then try to provide a draw, I mean, the photo and trying to justify your case under the NOI filing. So that's an option. Um, Luis. 
Um, just judging by uh, the amount of erosion that seemed to be occurring, that shown in those photographs, um, if there, over the last 20 or 30 years, no sand had been added there, there must have been a tremendous amount of sand um, to establish that beach to begin with, because otherwise you'd run out of sand at that rate of erosion. Um, secondly, um, the contention is that there has been no maintenance other than raking. Um, my experience with sand as, as uh, a mother with kids having a sandbox and replenishing the sand, uh, simple raking isn't going to maintain sand that looks like that, especially over 20 or 30 years. So just in terms of the mass balance of the beach, given the um, erosion that has been observed and the, the cleanliness of the sand, it seems as if something has been added. And I'm wondering if it might be with the uh, present owner, not with necessarily the valleys or the Crosby's. Thanks, Luis. Larry? Uh I'm back to what Mike Schultz said about the Ned Crosby's affidavit across the pond looking at the beach. Uh, he wasn't, he, he it might, might have specified the time frame when he was appearing and was attracted by the sand. It was probably uh, uh, somewhere late in the Lally ownership. But that being said, that certainly is credible evidence of, of viewing the sand location. Uh, prior to that time. Uh, the second matter that uh, appears to me that there's a, there clearly is a, 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 an, an edging on the grass side of the sand, uh, and that could have been, uh, could be metal, whatever it is. On the other side, uh, if Darcy was seeing um, sand going over the edges, and we're, that doesn't appear to be in dispute, um, uh, perhaps there could be a a higher or more substantial edge to keep the sand from eroding further. Uh, but the third thing is, is that my understanding, and I'll let the Mike uh, Schultz confirm this, is that there's no application or request at this point for um, adding more sand. Um, there is, uh, uh, if that was the case, that would be covered by the optional provision that Ed has offered, and that would require a notice of intent and that would open the door. But if they're not requesting more sand, they don't need to have uh, have that at this point as I see it. But it, what it would be is, is that uh, uh, the question then is, uh, would, would the enforcement order stand for removing the sand or would the uh, enforcement order not survive? Uh, and I think that, and the only other question I'd add, going back to John Abadili's balancing of the issues, um, uh, this is a, uh, a proceeding which calls for uh, a burden of proof to be met one way or the other. And in this case, uh, the question is, has the applicant's attorney uh, pro produced enough evidence to rebut the claim of the allegations uh, that, uh, that Ed has offered? And if so, then that's, that's a factual question that we have to decide. It's not it's a legal question to a certain extent, but it's fact. Uh, so I think that's the issue that we may ultimately be faced with having to resolve. So that's sort of the way I'm looking at it and balancing it out at this point. Thank you, Larry. Um, I saw Paula. Paula, you want to make a comment? Yeah, I just happened to be looking at the property lookup. And I just was trying to clarify the ownership issues because there obviously was an ownership change in 2014, and I wasn't sure if um, Councillor had said that there hadn't been any sand added after 2014 based on that change in ownership. I, I, I was a little confused because it's a different name for the ownership than what you had mentioned um, the, that, tonight. Uh, that's correct. Um, so. From a title standpoint, the property was held in what's called a nominee trust. 
Mm -hmm. So a trustee acts as the record title holder for the benefit of the, the actual owner who's the, um, the beneficiary. So okay. it was Ned Crosby and his family. Uh, John Halloran is his father-in-law who's an attorney. Okay, thank you. Josh? Yeah, I'm struggling with this quite a bit because I know both these gentlemen, um, upstanding citizens, uh, very honest people. Um, so I'm, I, I'm, I gotta say, I'm, I'm struggling a, quite a bit with this one. I would very much like to, uh, Michael, if, if you can come up with some photos, that would be, that would be very helpful, I think. I, I would be pleased to do that. I think um, from a timing standpoint, Mr. Lally was away at a wedding, um, so he was, was unable to really spend the time that he wished that he could do. Um, but I, I do think that that would be helpful if the commission would, uh, would like me to do that and would, um, that would be fine. Do, do, you, do you mind if I table this to January the 10th? So that give you a little bit more time to come up with small evidence in terms of justify your case. Uh, yes, uh, Mr. Chair, that would be acceptable. <laughs> okay, so I'll table this. Um, Graham, Robert, and Lisa C. Walters, the enforcement order to January the tenth. Yeah. Um, I need to vote. To, um, yes. Tom, I just want to add, I, I think it's, it really is a very simple case in one degree that, you know, our policy, our past practices are really clear. If it's a pre existing beach, he's, the applicant is allowed to keep it, not add to it. That's a separate issue. That's not before us. Right. If it was not pre existing, then the applicant would be required to remove it. The applicant always has a right to file an application or an NOI requesting it, but based on past precedent, it would probably be denied. So it's a, as Larry said, it's simply a simple factual question. So, Counselor, I think I, at least speaking for myself, need additional evidence to convince me of the history of this, especially the comment of the affidavit or stated in the affidavit about not adding it. I'd like to know who added that metal um, rail there. So it would help me factually at the next hearing to, to hear any additional evidence you can come up with. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Darcy, do I need to take a vote or can I, or I can just table You can table Okay. Thank you. The next item is Patricia J. Okay. McCarthy, 70 Eel River Road, Austinville, map 116, positive 092, failure to comply with and order conditions, SC3-5199, at. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, you're way ahead of me here. <laughs> Uh, okay, so this is actually a very simple thing. This came out of a, um, uh, they, they were getting getting ready to uh, put together a COC request. Uh, Emil had some discussions with John O'Day uh, about certain portions of the order of conditions. Um, and what it, what it came down to, uh, there was just a, a small, there was a small problem with the order uh, in the, was as, as part of the the original um, the original notice, uh, which was done I think uh, almost ten years ago now. Um, this was uh, there. There was a an order or a condition that was put in that the proposed invasive species control shall be, be certified. Advanced construction uh, meeting with, with the conservation agent would be required. The mitigation was. Um, in, in the narrative uh, that um, mitigation was in the form of management of invasives within uh, the buffer. And that was done without the, the consult consultation with the agent at the time, uh, as it was prescribed again in the, in the uh, special condition. There were no real um, areas where uh, they could do any other types of mitigation. So that's, and, and apparently at the time, uh, the commission felt that that was an appropriate uh, means for, for mitigation was the mitigation through invasive control was the appropriate uh, means for mitigation. 
uh, so long and short of it, uh, what what I'm really asking them to do more than anything else was to uh, produce a management plan that described how the the work was done. It was the the narrative didn't really get into what they were going to do or how they were going to manage or or control invasives, um, or really the, the the total extent of of uh, management and. Uh, Let's see. Uh, I'm sorry. So, uh, what I basically asked then is for them to come up with uh, to, to produce what what is essentially a management plan that explained how the how the mitigation uh, invasive treatment was was carried out, and more importantly, uh, how and what they needed to do uh, in order for them to move forward as to whether or not there was going to have to be an, an ongoing um, an ongoing condition for the certificate of compliance. So that's basically what the uh, enforcement order asked. It's, it's, it's more, I think it's more uh, a paperwork thing to uh, get get them uh, put put a, a, a way for them to get uh, this plan uh, into the record, uh, allow the, that, that to be uh, on the record. And uh, I think uh, in, in terms of the COC, uh, they're looking to to uh, do some ongoing conditions um, in terms of the, the invasive control as well. So, uh, just to let you know, uh, John has provided a, a draft plan for that already, and it looks good. Uh, but we're just sort of waiting to see what the commission felt on this one. A question from the commissioner. Before I go there, I recognize I think Pete is here. So George, Pete is in the meeting. And that's all I had my hand for at this point. Good, thank you. Thank you. Any questions from the commissioners to add on this? I think we agree with you, Ed, on that approach so that we can finish this project in terms of the COC and moving forwards. Larry. Yes, uh, I. it appears so that Ed is, uh, simply asking for a uh, an updated document or a more descriptive document as to the management plan uh, i don't necessarily see why it has to be handled by an enforcement order but in this particular case it appears that the uh, miss, miss mccarthy and uh, uh, with john o'day's assistance is uh, in sync on that and ed was kind enough to send to me at my request uh, some of the information about the prior uh, approval of um, in the NOI and so forth. So uh, I think it was clearly stated. I think it's a, uh, it, I you know it seems to be be a very routine documentary request and requirement that uh, uh, should be uh, handled without any any issue. Uh, I think that's it's clearly what the what the applicant is willing to do, what the property owner is willing to do, and what's in the best interest of. Closing, closing the file accurately. Why it might have been, why the COC might have been approved. It looks like it was approved in, uh, I'll look at Ed's notes here. Um, COC was approved, da 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 da, da uh, 2014 maybe? I don't yeah, know. We don't, the order, the order yeah. of conditions was the order yeah. done in 2000. Oh, the OOC. So there has, there's no COC yet on it then? That's yeah. why we're uh, here. Okay. Yeah. Why don't we just uh, affirm the enforcement order and move on? Because well, I think Larry's summary is. No, that's fine. I, I'm just yeah. I'm just wanting to clarify where we were. If that's where we are, I, I don't see there being any issue that, that uh, needs to be yeah. uh, negotiated. Could I have a motion to approve the enforcement order as written? So moved. Second. Roll call. Abadili? Aye. Foster? Aye. Gilmore? Aye. Hearn? Aye. Lee? Aye. Morin? Aye. Sam Poo? Aye. That's unanimous. Thank you. Good luck, John. The next enforcement order is Paul B. Devins, 43 Ponds Drive, Centerville, map 193, parcel 184 alterations of the buffer to a wetland resource area, unnamed pond and bordering vegetated wetland by cutting vegetation and unpermitted installation of approximately X square foot of patio within zero to 50 foot buffer and unpermitted installation of the patio fire pit and extensions of steps in the 50 to 100 foot buffer. Ed. 
Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, again, uh, for those of you on the commission who think you've seen this site before, you have. Um, this was a subject of a, a an enforcement order uh, back in 2020. Uh, it was under a different uh, homeowner, uh, and there was a little bit of an issue between homeowners uh, as to you know, relaying uh, what the conservation and what the 50-foot buffer was all about. So, uh, Mr. Turner bought the, the sub property last year. Um, again, you can see the this is his property. Uh, it is there's still lot, you know lots of trees here uh, throughout the throughout the buffer. Um, but before you get too panicky here, I just understand that this is the only, the, the, the picture on the left uh, is the only picture I had to compare to as a, a before a before picture. Uh, and that was taken uh, at the height of the growing season in 2020. Uh, so this is more or less the same angle for you uh, on the right. Uh, but again, it was taken in November, so things are, have died back considerably. So there's just, it, it, it looks it looks worse than it is. Uh, please on the um, the three four by four posts that you see in the ground and marked with the individual rings. Um, those were part of the the uh, enforcement order from back in 2020. Uh, at that time, it was a a cutting. Uh, there were tree cutting that, that had gone on uh, within the 50 foot buffer. Uh, and as part of that enforcement order, uh, we required the, the then owner at that time to install uh, these posts along the 50 foot buffer. Um, fast forwarding then to this year, uh, Mr. Tipton had, had proceeded to do some work. Uh, he had added a uh, a, a small patio and extended his steps uh, through through the area, uh, and the patio, a corner of the patio, does just, just slightly overhang the um, the 50 foot uh, buffer point. And then there was some clearing uh, that he had done uh, to the understory here in the uh, in the 50 foot buffer as well. And again, it's a different angle. Again, uh, again, understand that um, this is again during the height of growing season, so it looks a little bit. There, there is no no doubt that there has been uh, an impact uh, to the buffer, to the 50 foot buffer. Uh, that will, uh, if they leave it alone, uh, will grow back and uh, it will vegetate and look exactly like this again uh, within probably by the end of, of next next growing season. So uh, again, there, the bigger issue is that there's this little corner here on the uh, patio that overhangs that 50 foot. It's about eight, eight, or, eight or nine square feet uh, that overhang. And so uh, what I'm, I, I've, I had asked them to do some stabilization because there was a little bit of uh, dirt that had been moved. Uh, Mr. Tidden had done the uh, soil stabilization right away. Um, he, he was uh, he's been very compliant with all of that. All of our uh, whatever I've been asking him to do. Um, what we're asking then, uh, in terms of moving forward, is number one to uh, cease and desist from any more cutting within the 50 foot buffer. Uh, that will be allowed to, to uh, regrow naturally. And again, I think that will come back with no with no uh, real problems uh, within the year. Uh, the other thing then is to uh, create or essentially come up with a, with a way to way forward for for permitting. Uh, generally speaking, he would have to remove the the corner of the of the uh, patio or move the patio back, so it's completely outside of the 50 foot, and then uh, he would be allowed to to uh, move forward with a a um, an, R, an RDA application uh, to. A, allow that hardscape uh, in the 50 to 100. And um, we would also ask that he, again, understands and maintains those, those uh, no mow, no disturbance uh, area, uh, that those be maintained then in perpetuity. Uh, and then also have uh, reports uh, generated uh, for the next three years to, uh, again, monitor 
uh, ensure that the, the um, 50, uh, 50 foot buffer is growing back the way it's supposed to be. Thank you, Ed. Um, I think Paul is with us. Paul, do you understand what Ed has been talking to you and in terms of the enforcement order? You're muted, Paul. Uh, this is Paul Graves. Can you hear me now? Hello, this, Can you this hear me now? Uh, yeah, you're speaking yes. now. This is Paul Tivnan. Yeah. Yes, sir. Uh, Ed has been very um, forthright in what had happened. And um, the previous owners had told me that about the 50 foot zone, they never told me that those posts were 50 feet. So before I even started to build that, I measured it myself down and I thought I was within 55 feet of the uh, of the area, but I'm not sure what distinguishes where you guys talk about versus where I measured down to. Um, the other thing I, he had told me was that I could Vista cut, which I basically just took a weed whacker and whacked down some of the bushes. Um, Mr. Hoops has told me that I can, that that will grow back and I cannot cut it any lower than uh, four feet, I believe. So um, if, if you get the, the, if you file a Vista pruning request, you will have to file that file for permitting for that. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So. So we understand what that enforcement order that Ed has written. Yes, sir. Okay. Um, Any question from the commissioner? No. You're gonna get in there. You're just gonna kind of pull it over. Could I have a motion to approve the enforcement order as written. So moved. Second. Roll call. Sam Poo. Aye. Warren. Aye. Lee. Aye. Hearn. Aye. Foster. Aye. Abadili. Unbeat. Aye. Uh, aye. Gilmore, aye. That's unanimous. I did have Thank one you. quick question. Yep. yep. Um, that. Uh, and the patio is a, is a solid structure and um, there's very little of it hanging over that. Um, Mr. Hoop said that if it's not possible to move it, that I may be able to do some mitigation around it to um, make up for the area that has been affected. Um, yes, you can, but uh, go ahead, go and talk to discuss that with Ed. Okay. I can help you with. Okay. All right. Okay. Very good. I can give you a call uh, tomorrow or the, the next day, uh, Mr. Tibnan. We, we can discuss that. Okay. Thank you. The next enforcement order is David J. and Catherine S. DeLuca, 44 Manaway, um, Austinville, Map 116, Parcel 126, alteration of a wetland resource area and upper vegetative shrub and shrub wetland. And policing still. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, so this is a very unique uh, circumstance in that um, this was clearly a wetland violation uh, that was done back. I, it looks as though it's been done back sometime in 2014 or 15. Um, the Delucas just had the very bad misfortune of buying uh, buying the property uh, late last year, and uh, when they came to, they, they actually were, were doing their their own um, research. They they came into the uh, conservation office and were asking for certain, uh, just asking questions about what they can do with the uh, property. And at that time is when uh, I think it was Darcy and I think Darcy and I both had looked at it and um, we found that there had been this area of uh, vegetated wetland uh, that was marked on the on the plan. It's also again the whole area is also in, in all all of um, uh, zone. But when you 
start pulling things away, uh, you can see that, again, this was the marked area for the vegetative wetlands mapped area. Um, and you can probably tell what's coming. Uh, so that's what it looked like prior, uh, what is it? I think that was in 2000, I'm trying to move my, my screen here. Uh, that was 2012. Um, and so here, again, here's the corresponding edge of the vegetated wetland area, okay? Um, in 2014, uh, in the summertime, uh, it was still maintaining that same that same uh, look, but by 2015, wow. the previous owners had started uh, scraping away. Uh, they had cut cut vegetation down, certainly cut some trees down. Uh, looks like they had brought in some fill. Uh, that's 2016. Uh, and then by 2018, October 2018, it had been turned into uh, a green lawn and they had set up some raised bed gardening over in this portion as well. Uh, so uh, earlier this year, when the DeLucas came in to, to ask questions, uh, we had already, I had already spoken to them about it and I had visited with them before on site uh, and had asked them to, uh, at the very, at least before we even got to this point, that, uh, to, to leave all of this gardening area alone, uh, they did actually pull some of the some of the fencing that was out or that was in there. They, they pulled that out of the area, uh, and they've, they've been very respectful of the uh, wetlands issues. Uh, they they have let the whole area, this whole area go. Uh, they haven't been trying to do any maintenance or anything like that to that area. Again, you've got this this bigger portion of the green uh, green lawn that's that's there now. Um, and this was what the property looked like when the when the uh, Delucas, it was about a month or two, um, I think it was a month a month or two after I think you <laughs> after you had moved in uh, or after you had bought the bought the pro, bought the uh, property. So again, it's it's been a fairly extensive um, change in land use. Uh, it was not done by uh, the current homeowners at all. And what I'm trying to do now is trying trying to figure out a way that we can uh, get them to um, bring back some of the buffer at least. Uh, I think the wetland itself is, is probably uh, a, a, a non-issue at this point. Um, and so uh, what, I'm, what I'm trying to do is work with them to, uh, to come up with and, and develop a plan to restore uh, as much of the buffer as we possibly can. Um, just that they have, they've already gone through uh, through the expense of getting a plot plan put together by a professional land surveyor, uh, and that's what this is is representing. Uh, at the time when Brett Hall did the uh, wetland delineation, he was completely unaware that there was any other issue, so he did the. You know, he, he did the uh, delineation exactly where you would see the end of the lawn at the, at the, the end of the lawn uh, and right up against that the vegetated wetland that was remaining. Uh, and again, here's the 50 foot, 50 foot line off of that. Um, and again, if you look, if you look over in this section, this is the, the wetland, this light yellow area. It's just the wetland area that I've superimposed over the over the property, so it's this portion of the of the yard that we're uh, talking about trying to trying to bring back it with the, with some sort of a buffer planting and and maybe a little moist soil management as well. Uh, I think that's it. So again, um, they've already gone ahead and, and pr produced the uh, plot plan. Uh, I'd like to work with them uh, by just going out and, and meeting with them and a. Um, uh, you know, their wetland consultant and engineer uh, to uh, try and try and determine the best uh, course for moving forward with this. Um, and then again, uh, preserving and, and replanting and restoring as much as possible and to the best extent possible, uh, the, uh, the wetland and buffer uh, to that wetland uh, that, that we can do. Um, and so we, we're looking to do some some early meetings just to get that get that ball rolling. 
Um, just so you know, they are, uh, they would like to do some other work uh, to the house itself. So uh, we're trying to get all of this done uh, in a relatively short time span so they can start moving, they can move forward with, with permitting as well for, for another project that they'd like to do. So uh, if there's any other questions, I'd be glad to answer. Uh, the Lucas are also uh, in the audience. Thank you, Ed. And thank you, Dave and Catherine, for working with Ed on these issues that, unfortunately, you are inherited the problems from the previous owner. But the land is going with you, so you know you need you are responsible for these corrections um, that we identify. Um, I I hope you understand what Ed is asking you to do uh, in terms of the enforcement order, and it seems like you know you're willing to work with him. So thank you for that, Larry. I would like to just uh, have Ed put the last. A plot plan up on the screen again, so I can be, be specific with what he said. I followed it, but I was I put my hand up in the first place, not knowing that this plot plan had been done. So this is very helpful that it has been done, and uh, I would just like to clarify my understanding of it. I can use my arrow here, my arrow. It looks to me, Ed, that this is the 50 right here. Uh, and that this, that this is the part that you want to to be uh, brought back into a wetland area. Is it a wetland or is it a resource area? What, which which one is it? Well, the wetland. I mean, I, there's a possibility of bringing some wetland uh, wetland species back in along this fringe. I would think, for okay. the most part, we're going to have to keep it to more like a vegetative wetland uh, buffer uh, in in this this area. Uh, all right, so. Is there a way it can be? Is there a way it could be done naturally with minimal expense to them, or is that something that you're going to explore with them? Well, I'm certainly working with them to to do the the uh, the way forward for that. Uh, there's going to have to be some scraping of of lawn, um, and then you know replanting uh, with with uh, with wetland buffer species. Um, and then we'll just uh, again we'll we'll make sure that we uh, put in and, and, and the enforcement order asks that they put in a uh, permanent no uh, no mo no disturbance demarcation, uh, which is going to essentially run along that along this line here. You see there being a, some sort of a fence or, no, or barrier that's visible, or is that not going to be? Yeah, no, it'll have to be just our standard. Our, our standard is either a, a low, a low single rail, split rail, or uh, you know, granite bollards, or you know, rocks, or something like something, something that's going to be there permanently and and be there. Something so a landscaper can say, okay, I'm not supposed to go in there. Okay, and and my final question is: Is this something that's going to need to come back to us, or is it something that's just going to be handled and you're going to sign off on it? Uh, hopefully, we'll be able to get everything signed off uh, as quickly as possible, so they can move on with their lives, and we can we can do the same, and we can get a, a recovered uh, buffer. And I think they they certainly are trying to work toward, toward that end. Okay, I'm I'm looking at them on the screen, so I'd like them to just comment and confirm that, just so there's no misunderstanding. They may have other questions too, but I appreciate what the effort you're making to help them. Thank you very much. Sure. Well, the question, if if I may uh, speak on behalf of David and Kathy Deluca, um, we are obviously unrepresentative, for, unrepresented for purposes of this meeting. This is all new to us, and it's uh, somewhat fascinating. And I applaud you all for your efforts. Um, yeah, it, it's been a pleasure working with Ed and Darcy. And um, as you said, you know, we we had no prior knowledge of this condition. Certainly didn't have a hand in it. And uh, we just want to, you know, remain on the right side of the law and do what's right. And uh, you know, to the extent we can uh, repair the situation with the nominal cost and uh, perhaps even better plantings than some of the invasive. Uh, rugged stuff that's in there. Um, we welcome that as well, but uh, we're certainly happy to work with Ed and conservation uh, to whatever degree necessary. And also, I want to mention we've um, we're here long term. We're this is our forever home, um, and we are couldn't be more thrilled to live in your area. We have family in there, and 
I'm just excited to live near family. And then we've been in Vermont for the last 19 years um, with, uh, with a, a nice amount of uh, plot of land and trees and we, we respect the environment and we'll always do that, so. Thank you. Thank you for working with Ed. Pete? Yes, Thank I'd you. certainly like to applaud the DeLucas. Thank you so very much for sharing our care for our environment. Um, Ed, sort of a quick question here, and I don't want to be onerous. Um, is the amount of fill that was brought in there, is that going to be any hindrance to the establishment of any buffer plants? Yeah, uh, yeah so we're, we're going to have to scrape. They're, they're going to definitely going to have to scrape some, some of that uh, back and um, uh, amend it with, with more of a wetland type soil, a okay. soil mix, but Good yeah, that, that'll, that would be part of it. So yeah, you've already thought about this. Thank mm -hmm. you. Yep. Nice. We have a motion to approve the enforcement order as written. So moved. Second. Second. Roll call. Abedili. Aye. Foster. Aye. Gilmore, aye. Hearn. Aye. Lee. Aye. Warren. Aye. Sam Poo. Aye. That's unanimous. Just one Thank question you. for the DeLucas. Why would you move from Vermont? <laughs> oh, come on, George. Hey, guys, welcome to the Cape. Good luck. Thank you very welcome much. Welcome to the Cape. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Just for your information, George, go up to Vermont once in a while. <laughs> the last enforcement order is Jeffrey D. Davinsky and Pamela E. Shield, 661 Wood 149, Marston's Mill, Mon Map 101, Parcel 001, alterations of a wetland resource area. Hamlin Pond by replacing unpermitted field sand in and on the pond at a pond shore. Ed. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, again, if this uh, site sounds familiar to you, uh, there was a recent uh, RDA uh, filing with you uh, where you had de uh, determined, done it, issued a um, negative determination for a uh, uh, driveway uh, replacement. Um, just to give you an idea again, you've got route, route 149 is over here. Uh, the property that we're, or the portion of the property we're talking about is the uh, pond shore that's right in, in front of the house. There, there is a uh, small um, timber tied, uh, a railroad tied type um, uh, retaining wall that runs right along the property edge. Uh, and separates the upland property uh, from the pond and pond shore. Uh, and you can see that under most circumstances, I think in most years, uh, the pond edge is pretty much right there. Uh, if it's not right up against the, the retaining wall, it is very within a, a, cup, a foot or two of the retaining wall. Um, and so this is the area where uh, there has been some, there was some sand that had been uh, had been dumped uh, by the property owners. Uh, again, they were trying to just uh, create a little bit more of a softer uh, sand area. Uh, they enjoy their enjoy, enjoy swimming in the pond, and they were just trying to again trying to do um, a soft a type soft softer type, um, sediment uh, for walking out of the out of the water. Um, you can see this is what the site looked like. Uh, I think it was what October, or sorry, uh, November, uh, November eighth. I think it was when um, this when we, or actually, I think it was November seventh when uh, we were first alerted. But Emil had kind of had run over and taken a quick look, and uh, I was I was out of the office at that point. Um, and then the next day, I went out and uh, met with the homeowner. Uh, with Pamela, and uh, we discussed what what needed to go on. Again, you can see that there was about um, four to five cubic yards of, of sand that had been uh, deposited on the pond shore. Uh, and again, they had come in from um, 
if you're familiar with the area, there's a, a small boat ramp, uh, town boat ramp that that is in the, in that uh, in the area right over here, and they had accessed uh, and dumped the sand that way. Uh, so uh, pretty much with this, uh, I, I had asked that they immediately put a uh, siltation barrier uh, to, to keep any of the sand from floating from from uh, eroding down into the any further into the into the pond uh, this year because of just because of the drought conditions that we've undergone throughout the throughout the past uh, six or eight months. Uh, the pond shore was ex was uh, significantly exposed, uh, which allowed them to get again to more, more sand to go to be put down and spread uh, spread throughout the area. Um, so I, I get I did get them to put that erosion control up right away, uh, which they did. Uh, and then we also contacted Natural Heritage. Uh, the Natural Heritage Endangered Species Program uh, needed to be notified. Um, Again, because this particular area and this particular pond shore is estimated habitat for uh, several uh, endangered and threatened uh, plant species, and so uh, we were waiting on, on on sort of on a hold for Natural Heritage to get back to us. They did eventually get back to us, and uh, they had agreed with what I was asking to do in the original. Um, the, uh, there was a slight, like, a slight difference, but uh, we had uh, we had gone through and um, had developed a plan for removal of the sand. Uh, the natural heritage uh, biologists agreed with me. Uh, they said to go ahead and, and proceed with the uh, removal. Uh, that the uh, that it needed to be done by uh, March March first. Uh, I had asked that had then moved that time frame up uh, considerably uh, because I didn't want any more. The, the, the last time I was out there, uh, there was heavy wind uh, blowing on shore, and um, you know the the uh, erosion control would not have been able to stand several months of, of that kind of uh, that kind of wind and wave action, and then a rising of the, of the water level. So um, I asked that they had they go out and remove the sand. Uh, just as a, a course of, um, or just so you understand, I was out there uh, this afternoon and uh, they were working on it. I, I had met with them last week uh, to go over the, the rules and the procedures for removing the sand. Um, they were out there today and, and by the time I got out there, uh, it was pretty much well, well completed and the sand has now been for the most part removed. Uh, I will do a final inspection uh, sometime toward the end of the week and hopefully be able to remove the uh, siltation at that point and everything should be back uh, more or less uh, to normal. And if you have any questions, I'd be glad to answer them. Thank you for the following up with the homeowner and the NHSP on this on this enforcement order. Um, I think the homeowner is here, right, Pamela? Let's see her at one point, I think. She's I here. She, if she wants to I unmute and say something. Pamela, is it you? Yeah, Pamela. Oh, yeah, I'm here. There Mm -hmm. I'm here. I've been here the whole time. Thank you for, work, thank you for working with Ed. So do you have any questions um, about the enforcement order? No. And, and I want to clarify that, yeah, we did just recently go through the process of an RDA to take out the asphalt driveway and put in indigenous gravel. Um, and we planted 20 trees. And I'm really embarrassed. Um, of our with our ignorance as you know sitting in on this meeting for the last two hours and learning more about the environment in which of the house that we recently purchased I have a whole new level of respect and um like I don't mean to get all choked up but I I really you know we didn't understand the magnitude of adding sand to our sandy beach so We've tried to do everything we can do as quickly as possible 
to remediate the problem and not cause any further any damage to the beautiful environment. Thank you. And Thank I you do so. have to clarify though, I, I believe Ed has been to the site a few times now, and I think that we got the bio waddle up with the staking and the silt fence quickly enough that I, I don't think any of the sand has gone into the pond. Um, so that's just a, a footnote. Yep, yep. Think about working with Ed. Any questions for the commissioner? Um, no, again, I, I'm very, very sorry. Peter's hand both, is up, Tom. Both Larry and Peter's hands are up, Tom. Oh, sorry, Larry. Um, I think I'm unmuted. Yeah, I'm unmuted. Um, and I've got a couple of questions to ask you based upon your written narrative uh, on this. And uh, and you now in, in the first phase, you say uh, contact uh, a natural heritage. Uh, and then I can only presume that you did reach them because they got in touch with you. Was it verbal or did they send you a written report? Uh, I contact both by phone and email and they they replied with an email. Uh, okay, and did the email specify what you have just said that they recommended? They said they agreed with my assessment and that they wanted us to move forward. And as I said, they wanted everything done by March 1st. I moved the, the deadline up to December 22nd. Okay, is the, uh, I, I had not seen uh, natural heritage is what they said. So that, that's what I'm asking. And you said that they, that's what they said. Uh, the other question, what, and, and the endangered species you said is plant life? There's plants, yes, so and, endangered and, threatened plants. And are the plants uh, associated with the uh, bordering edge of this property or are they just throughout the area? They're in the pond shore, yes. Uh, all right, and, the, and from your observation, was there uh, an existing sand area there? I guess you could call it a beach. Was there something there before this sand was put on top of it? There is no evidence that there was ever a beach there Again, as I said, the, the water, probably eight out of 10 years, uh, is right up against the, the revetment. Uh, okay, well, I- Or sorry, I, retaining wall. Uh, all right, so you did, you, uh, rather, rather than what happened with the very first hearing we heard tonight where you gave them an option, uh, you didn't give these people an option to apply for that, is that correct? Because it's estimated habitat and that would be something that natural heritage would not support. All right, well, that's, I, I just want that clarified for the record. So uh, if you can provide, make sure that the uh, written uh, email from them is included uh, with the order, I'd appreciate that. All right, I will add that. All right, thank, thank you. Peter? So cool, again, uh, Pamela, thank you so much. Uh, I can em empathize with uh, the general public's ignorance as to the importance of the littoral zone, that zone close to the water's edge, down into the water's edge, for the health of our lake ecosystems. Hamblin Pond, many of you know I'm a nut about fishing. Hamblin Pond is a jewel within the town of Barnstable for cold water fishing, not only including trout, but many species of bass. Um, the A natural shoreline, which this borders a large area to the south and west of public land that the town of Barcelona owns, and it's all natural shoreline there. And having that shoreline natural is a big bonus to the creatures, plant, animal, and fish that feed upon some of these creatures of these organisms at and near the water's edge. So thank you, Ms. Pamela, for your education. It came here rather a hard way, but thank you for working with Ed to make this right. Thank you, Peek. Any more questions? Can I have a motion to approve the enforcement order as written? So moved. Second. Roll call. Abadili. Aye. Foster. Aye. 
Gilmore, aye. Hearn? Aye. Lee? Aye. Morin? Aye. Sam Poo? Aye. That's unanimous. Thank, oh, you, thank you for working with Ed, and uh, you know he will give you some more directions moving more forward. Thank you. Thanks. There is one criminal citation. I'm just going to read that into the record. This is for the family EPO um, for the alterations of a wetland resource area at the Hamlin Pond for two hundred dollars. And then for the certificate of compliance, we have three easy order, easy certificates. First one is Cape Beach House LLC SC3-5573. The second one is Mark Kilman SC3-4989. And the third one is Michael and Elizabeth Fish Revocable Trust SC3-5855. Could I have a motion to approve the certificate of compliance? So moved. Second. Roll call. Sam Poo. Aye. Morin. Aye. Lee. Lee. Aye. Hearn. Aye. Gilmore, aye. Foster. Aye. Abadili. Aye. That's unanimous. Thank you. Before I open up the second half of the hearing for the Bonsville Conservation Commission, I would like to ask George to do a roll call for the quorum purpose. Abadili. Present. Foster. Present. Gilmore, present. Hearn. Present. Lee. Present. Morin. Present. Sam Poo. Present. Administrator Darcy Carling. Present. Staff member Kim Cavanaugh. Present. Uh, we have a quorum and the floor is yours, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. I think under the provisions of Mad General Law, Chapter 131, Section 40, and or Chapter 237 of the Code of Town of Barnstable, the Barnstable Conservation Commission will hold a public hearing on Tuesday, December the 13th, 2022, at 4.30 p.m. on the applications of Catherine M. Buckley, Buckley Robert Curley, Town of Barnstable, DBW, Town of Barnstable, DBW, the hearing will be held remotely as televised on Channel 18. The plans and deprecation are on file and may be reviewed by scheduling appointments by sending email requests to Darcy Curley at 2.30 South Street, Hyannis. This meeting is being recorded and transmitted by the Information Technology Department of Town of Bonds on Channel 18. Under Mass General Law Chapter 38, Section 20, anyone else desiring to make such a recording or transmission Please let Channel 18 know I know. Hearing none, this afternoon's hearing agenda is posted on the town's website. On the agenda, next to each application is the town owner with the town of Barnstable for the cause of advertisement. Please send your checks to Conservation Division at 2.30 South Street before the hearing. We both participate. The Conservation Commission's public hearing will be held by remote participation as a result of an act extending some COVID-19 measures adopted during the state of an emergency signed up by the Lieutenant Governor on July 16, 2023, suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law. We will public access to this hearing shall so be provided in the following manner. One, the hearing will be televised via Channel 18. Second, real-time public comment can be addressed to the Conservation Commission utilizing Zoom links 8734361-8547 or use the toll-free phone number 888-475-4499 as shown on the agenda. Third, the public can also email the comments to darcy.curly at town.barnstable.ma.us town at least eight hours prior to the hearing. Please note the first NOI for the town of Barnstable DBW has request for a continuance without testimony to January the 10th, 2023. This NOI is related to the alum treatment in Super Bond. We have two LDA. The first one is Catherine M. Barkley, proposed driveway entrance to 235 Smoke Valley Road from Zero Smoke Valley Road, Marstonsville, as on the assessor's map 096. Puzzle 004-006, John. Uh, good evening, John O'Day from Sullivan Engineering Consulting representing the applicants. I'll pull up the plan that was submitted with this request. Uh, this is the property at 235 Smoke Valley Road developed with a house. 
the project is to do a new driveway that comes in from what is referred to as zero smoke valley. Uh, the beginning 40, 50 feet of that are located within the flood zone, uh, which is what precipitated this uh, application to you. And uh, the point of the project is to just get better access to that house. The existing driveway is steep. It comes in uh, kind of on the back side of the driveway, and they think that this would be a, a better uh, use of their property. And I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have about the project. Question from the commissioner. Seeing none. Chain the wake team, any public comment on this? Seeing none. Could I have a motion to approve this project as a negative determination? So moved. Second. Roll call. Abadili? Aye. Foster? Aye. Gilmore, aye. Hearn? Aye. Lee? Aye. Morin? Aye. Sam Poo? Aye. That's unanimous. Thank you. Thank you. Good luck. The second LDA is Robert Curley in enclosed existing porch addition and adding 14 by 6 frost wall at 117 Lake Elizabeth Drive, Standerville, as soon as the assessor's map 226 Pazo 053. Um, this is, is it Bill? Bill O'Brien. Do you want to unmute yourself, Bill? Thank you. <laughs> <clears throat> May I speak? Yeah, go ahead. Okay, so uh, I'm representing Bob and Lauren Quarry. Uh, this project was originally uh, approved in 2014. They hired a contractor. Uh, he Part of the work he was supposed to do was the covered porch was supposed to be brought out to be flush with the front of the house. Um, he, he never com he, he completed the work, but he never did this portion of the project. Um, they have hired uh, house to mill builders who would like to uh, uh, add a 14 by 6 frost wall so we can bring the uh, the covered porch out flush for the front of the house. And it's within 58 feet of the, uh, of the uh, buffer zone. So um, I'm requesting. Thank you. Thank Any you. Questions? Any questions from the commissioner? None. Chandler 18, any public comment on this? Seeing none. Could I have a motion to approve this project as, as a negative determination? So moved. Second. Roll call. Abadili? Aye. Foster? Aye. Gilmore? Aye. Hearn? Aye. Lee? Aye. Warren? Aye. Sam Poole? Aye. That's unanimous. Thank you. Good Thank luck. you so much. We have NOI. The first one is Town of Barnstable, DBW. First in activations using alum applied it at a lot to exceed the dosage of 13.5 gram per meter square to depths greater than 8 meters in Subo Pond, Marson's Mill. The town has request for a continuance without testimony to January the 10th, 2023. Could I have a motion to continue this application to January the 10th, 2023 without testimony? So, second. Roll call. Abadili. Aye. Foster. Aye. Gilmore, aye. Hearn. Aye. Lee. Aye. Warren. Aye. Sam Poo. Aye. That's unanimous. The second NOI is Town of Barnstable again. DVW proposed construction of a new 0 0.72 bike cycle, bicycle and pedestrian share use path on the west side of Beaches Way from 450 feet north of the Farmers Hill Route 8 to Pink Way. Um, Paul from the town. Paul Gray. Yes, Mr. Chairman, I'm here. Uh, Go ahead. I believe we want to talk about the project and introductions to the uh, v VHP team. Yes. Uh, one of our uh, 
representatives from one of our um, consultant uh, reps from BHB is on this call. I'm, I'm not um, sure which one at this point, but uh, they um, filed the application and are prepared to present it. And um, of course, I'll be of any help I can. Thank you, um, Chair. I think, I think Steve is on the, Steve and Dan. Yep. That's correct. Um, I, I can I can share my screen, Steve, if you want me to get that up. Sounds good. Okay, can everyone see that? Yes. All right, so good evening, everyone. Um, thank you for having us tonight and hearing about this project. It's uh, a just under three quarters of a mile shared use path proposed along Bierce's way. This is starting just north of Route 28, about 450 feet or so, up and then extending up to Pitcher's Way. And we're before you tonight because a portion of this alignment does enter the 100-foot buffer and 50-foot buffer established by the ordinance associated with these vegetated wetlands, which are located between the DPW driveway and the water department driveway. Uh, this work is not gonna propose any impact to these resources. Um, erosion and sedimentation controls will be used uh, throughout the duration of construction in this area. Uh, I should note that these are also uh, isolated wetlands, uh, so they do not support a 100-foot buffer under the Wetlands Protection Act. Uh, so this application is only being filed underneath uh, under the ordinance. Uh, Steve, would you like to speak a little more to the project particulars itself? Sure. So the path is, or the, sorry, the project is proposing to construct a 10-foot wide shared use path. Uh, paved uh, for the length is going to meet in with the recent construction that extended the shared use path uh, north from the Route 28 Bears' Way intersection up to the DPW driveway that we see labeled here on the screen that, that Dan's sharing. And it'll continue, like you said, up to Pitcher's Way uh, consistently along the, the west side of Bears' Way. And it kind of comes in and out of the layout of Bears' Way and the town parcel that the uh, water treatment plant is is located on. Um, it will be a Mass DOT um, construction oversight projects. So it'll be subject to all the standard oversight procedures that District 5 has on any of their projects uh, for environmental permitting um, and, you know, sedimentation control maintenance and things like that. So um, that's about all there is to the projects. Um, be happy to answer any questions that are anything else on the specifics of it. Thank you, Steve. One thing I have to apologize is I did not have a chance to go and look at your stormwater report, which I will do that. Um, so um, any question from the commissioner, Bill? Yeah, I have kind of a, I don't know, picky but significant point, I think. Um, I know we go back to a full screen, Bill, so we can hear you better, see you better? Uh, we can. Who can do that? I can stop sharing. If stop that helps. sharing. There we go. Thank, thank you for doing that. Sorry, Bill. It's just better. With I, I noticed that there are um, a couple of what are called certified vernal pools, and they have a 100 foot buffer. And you have it on a, you have it on, oh, God. It says figure two, but I don't know what section. But anyway, in your, in your package, the project basically just skirts the 100 foot buffer of a couple of vernal pools. Vernal pools are unusual habitats for certain um, reptiles and amphibians, like the spotted salamander migrates to them and then, you know, will migrate out of there. And they're really unusual. And um, to the extent that you were able to you know, sort of not work in the vicinity of that, you know, do the work for near, right in the proximity of those vernal pools, don't work during spring. I think it would be a, you know, a, a benefit to salamanders and turtles utilizing those vernal pools. I don't know if you can do that, but it would be, it would be a good thing. They're really considered in, in, in the ecology world, uh, a really unusual kind of habitat that, that we try to protect. Is it possible to like have a, you know, uh, don't do anything from March to June, you know, right in that area? There will be animals migrating to and fro from that vernal pool, especially during the springtime. 
I'm trying to find the figure that you're referencing, um, I, I just can, so we get a sense of the job, the, the location of it. Steve, I can actually share this. This is uh, okay. is figure three in the uh, NOI package, which shows the uh, extent of natural heritage uh, jurisdictional areas, either uh, estimated or priority habitat, and also the uh, vernal pools. So this, are you sharing the screen? It should be coming up now. There we go. Yep. Uh, so here are our limits. These are two uh, vernal pools called out here as potential vernal pools. Um, and these are actually, given the scale of this, these are more like a little over a thousand feet away from the project but, limits. But, but you have, but you have on, you, know, you have so many different sections here. There is a, a March 1st, 2022 figure two, and it says environmental constraints and it shows at the very southern end, it's the very southern end of uh, that red line that we're looking at right there. There are two vernal pools right in that um, area. And it says certified vernal pools. And I know that we have um, what are called potential vernal pools that haven't been certified by a biologist that indeed these are these important rare things. I don't know how to what is the section here? It's a VHB memorandum appendix figure two. That's, I don't know. You have a lot of sections here. Anyway, there. if you look through your, your package, you will see vernal pools. There it is right there. Exactly. Yeah, so this is, um, so yeah, this is in the, the stormwater report. Um, this area here is the 100 foot buffer off of uh, the two, uh, the, so the, the blue line here is actually the vegetated wetlands that we discussed in the narrative and uh, showed in the plans. The, so I, I do see where it's confusing and that this is this is blue and this is also blue, but they're- That's not, uh, the, they're not vernal pools then? No, no, the, these, these are not. They're, they're isolated wetlands. They were, uh, I, I believe from what um, the scientists who did the delineation said, these were at one point drainage basins, um, some of which that do dry up, but um, they're not listed as as certified vernal pools. Okay. Okay. Well then, no, they, they, he's showing those two red dots as for potential vernal pools. But there yeah. are, Right. Okay. But those are but those two little circle things with the red circle around them are not. Those are know. those are not. Those are those are and, vegetated and wetlands, but not vernal pools. And, and as they say, never mind. Thank you. No <laughs> then no. We appreciate any comments. So those two are kind of isolated wetland within the wastewater plant. I have seen them before. So, um, Pete? Uh, okay, so if those are not vernal pools, even potential vernal pools, I don't have much to say. I myself have certified at least five vernal pools with the state in my history here in West Barnstable. So I'm very well aware of the science that Dr. Hearn brought forth as to their vital importance primarily to amphibian species, a few reptiles as well, and their need to be undisturbed from about mid-March through to early June. So thank you, Bill, for bringing that up. But it's a moot point. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, what, is, what kind of construction schedule are, are you looking at? Sorry, is the timeline or the seasonal schedule? I mean, the timeline for the project. For the project. So the project is scheduled to be advertised um, by, I think, August of this coming year, August 2023. Um, okay. The first construction season would likely be late fall into the winter of 2023-2024. And completion? Uh, I believe the construction duration would probably be about, let's see, 2024 winter to 2025 spring. Okay. We're going to go, gonna go on kind of rough estimate. Right, right, right. Um, 10, 18, any, oh, Commissioner, is there any more questions? Seeing none, 10, 18, any public comment on this? Seeing none. Could I have a motion to approve this project as submitted by subjects to the stormwater review by the chair? Come on. I think. Roll call. Abadili. Aye. Gilmore. Aye. Hearn. Aye. Foster. Aye. Lee. Aye. Tempo. Aye. 
Morin. Aye. That's unanimous. Thank you. Good luck. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. We have two, we have two sets of minutes, November the 1st and November the 22nd. Mr. Chairman, I make a motion and we accept the minutes as written. Second. Second. Roll call. Abedili? Aye. Foster? Aye. Gilmore? Aye. Hearn? Aye. Lee? Aye. Warren? Aye. Campu? Aye. That's unanimous. Our next meeting is December the 20th, and there will be a executive session for that. Um, so I will we'll send out the agenda at that time to let you know. Um, could I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. Roll call. Abedili? Aye. Foster? Aye. Gilmore, aye. Hearn? Aye. Lee? Aye. Morin? Aye. Sam Poole?